Kia ora. Welcome to episode 71 of the SWNZ podcast, the podcast for New Zealand Star Wars fans. My name is Matt. And my name is Christy. This is a special edition of the SWNZ podcast. Usually we would, we would be doing this one or two days later in the week, but Star Wars Celebration Anaheim has just concluded and there is an awful lot, an awful lot of exciting news to catch up on. So today we are just going to be doing a roundup of Star Wars Celebration news and or news that have come that has come through official channels about things that were discussed and that cropped up at Star Wars Celebration. And tomorrow we will be doing a separate podcast where we will be talking in particular about the first two episodes of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now we're still just coming down off a bit of a high from all the news that we've been watching online and reading about online from Star Wars Celebration and this major announcement that the next Star Wars Celebration event is less than one year away. That's good news and bad news. It's a bit of a challenge to potentially budget and plan for. But nonetheless, it is going to be taking place at the Excel Centre in London on April the 7th to the 10th, 2023. Yeah, this is a sort of a bittersweet moment for us because this is the first celebration since 2010 that either of us have not been able to attend in person. So we've been eagerly sort of watching the live streams, you know, reading through as much as the leaked information and all the sort of fan sites of from people on the ground there where they're able to sort of keep up and sort of get things out from the panels because unfortunately a lot of the content that's out and was revealed has not been made formally, officially available online. Yeah, well, that's the thing. <laughs> Just, just before we get too deep into things, there's definitely some positives about this celebration, watching it from afar. There's definitely been some negatives that we have observed and become aware of. And I think one of the ones that's, eh, don't really want to dwell on the negative aspects too much, but one of the more disappointing aspects is that there was a lot of content that was still locked away from the rest of the Star Wars fandom. This didn't affect, just affect those of us that were watching from afar. Even if you had tickets to the event, if you couldn't get into one of these specific panels, you did not see this exclusive content that they were screening for some of this, for some of these titles. Yeah, so people were sort of, I saw some sentiments online where people talking about that even if you were sort of the privileged that could attend in person, you've paid your money. In previous celebrations, they sort of had big TVs and, and screens scattered around the convention center. So even if you weren't inside the panels, you could watch them sort of on the screens broadcast live as you wandered around or stood mm. in line for things. So you could still sort of keep up with the excitement and what was going on at the convention. It sounds like that wasn't really the case this time. No. There were some really, really big uh, material releases that, that we missed out on and that everyone else missed out on. For instance, we did get trailers for Andor, Season 2 of Bad Batch, and the Jedi Survivor video game trailer. But in addition to that, there was the next season of Mando material shown. There was information about the Tales of Jedi animated series, and there was even Ahsoka material shown, and none, none of that is formally released. There are leaked leaked cam videos of it from people publishing it from their cell phones but those have been taken down very promptly they're a little bit hard to chase and they're obviously very very poor quality and it just feels a bit of a shame that that stuff is locked away it seems weird because they let some people see it in full view on a ginormous screen in these panel rooms and then they're like oh no that person in that country nope they're not allowed to see it and it's like well what is it's not none of the stuff is spoilery it's all pretty high level very sort of teaser of a teaser level at this point nothing really sort of that's gonna ruin people's experience oh, no that's the thing if fans are allowed to see it fans all fans should be allowed to see it there was a yeah. push there was t-shirts available at the celebration store that declared that Star Wars is for everybody this is a year where it's been a lot a lot more challenging for some people to go some people have decided not to go because of the health risk and some people have been unable to afford to go because of the complications of the previous couple of years so this was not a year to be locking away content like this in, in our opinion especially when they as you say literally had t-shirts saying star wars is for everybody no if you were privileged and american if you're in good health, so COVID isn't a risk for you, if you don't have sort of vulnerable children or elderly in your sort of close family circle, and if you didn't take a financial hit with your work circumstances or financial circumstances in the last couple of years, and of course, just the just the uh, privilege of living close to Anaheim puts you in a, in a better advantage to attend these things in person as well. So a little bit annoying for the international fans, but then I guess the announcement that it's in London is kind of a little bit of an offset there. They're feels exciting for international fans all right let's move on let's really try and strike a bit more of a positive note now 
One of the things that was released at Celebration was the Andor trailer. We talked about this in detail in our last podcast because that came out on the first day of Celebration, which was last Thursday New Zealand time. So we won't we won't revisit that one too much, but do check out our last podcast if you want to hear our thoughts on the Andor trailer, which we very much enjoyed. And we're looking forward to seeing that when it debuts on Disney Plus on August the 31st. But the next big one came out just this morning was the Season 2 Bad Batch trailer. We've put a gallery of scene-by-scene screen caps up on SWNZ if you want to check those out one frame at a time as well as watching the video in its entirety. But we've been looking forward to the Bad Batch Season 2 for a while. Uh, It has been delayed from the date that was initially promised to us for no specific reason, perhaps just scheduling in relation to the other other titles that may be released on Disney+. Plus. But nonetheless, that will be coming to us later in the year. Yeah, there's not too much spoilery in this trailer. It kind of gives us a look at the characters. A few of them have sort of slightly sort of updated outfits. We, uh, Omega in particular has a new outfit. We see the appearance of a couple of specific characters. Most notable for me, and I, I assume a few other people, is we see Cody, what mm-hmm. appears to be yep. Cody in this Almost one. Certainly. And of course, Emperor Palpatine. He does speak in the trailer. So I'm waiting to see confirmation to see if this is a voice actor or whether they did get Ian McDermott in this because he did hint at some sort of involvement in an upcoming show a little while back. I, I would be very, very happy if this is him. It does sound like him, but I know there are some very talented voice actors that have been sort of doing Palpatine for a while. So that was kind of exciting because obviously they touch on Order 66 and sort of the new empire and stuff like that so that was really exciting and lots of other little tidbits in this not too much about the story no no well clearly omega and the team have matured they've changed their armor as you said omega is looking a lot more proficient with her weapon she fends off a number of uh, creatures in in the uh, clip we saw i like the appearance of a lot of clone commandos i'm a big fan of republic commandos and uh, good to see that armor being carried over into the canon as in, in this format we also saw, is it Genji the Wookiee with the yes. lightsaber? Yes, the Wookiee that we saw in the Clone Wars. Because obviously we are aware, I mean, obviously back in the prequel movie era, it felt like, okay, all the Jedi got wiped out. As we have gotten more content and more stories, we sort of felt like it wasn't just instantaneous death for all the Jedi. That There were some that hid, that managed to escape. Um, well, and it's so, coming through so much more. It's yes. coming through in Obi-Wan Kenobi. And I think one of the key lines, and I think it's Hunter that says it, there's he says something along the lines of there's more out there yeah. that need our help. And I, and I don't need, he could be referring in part to Jedi, but also to other clones that have mm. uh, no longer have a place in the galaxy. Yeah. Because obviously we know the likes of Kanan, you know, with the strong sort of storyline through Rebels. Obviously he was a Jedi in training and was not, you know, killed in Order 66. So I think sort of playing through with that, because the Bad Batch is a spin-off of the Clone Wars, we're getting a sort of continuation of that. And it'll be interesting to see where they go with that, how they'll sort of treat that. Because obviously by the time we get to the original trilogy, most of the Jedi, we presume, are gone. So it'll be interesting to see if they sort of play it as a dark moment or more of an inspirational, full of hope that some survived. Yeah. All right. So like I said, we don't have a solid date for that, but I think we can presume that it will be... It was fall. Yeah, yeah. So towards the end of the year, presumably between Andor and Mandalorian Season 3 next year. No, that's exactly what I was about to say, because I was just trying to think. We've got 12 episodes of Andor. Andor starts on August, so yeah, in the latter part of the year, just just before December with a bit of luck, it will kick off. All right, we also saw, there were also panels specifically for Ahsoka and Season 3 of Mando. In regards to Ahsoka, there were some very, very interesting revelations in particular, um, the actress Natasha Liu Bordizo, who plays Sabine. Now, we knew that historically, but it has been officially confirmed now. She made an appearance, and it was very exciting to see her experience her first celebration as a Star Wars character and to see a relationship with Rosario Dawson, who plays Ahsoka. Yeah, the way that they interacted, it almost felt like this is going to be not just sort of like, oh, the adventures of Ahsoka running around the galaxy by herself. It felt like they're going to be quite close. They talked about training, um, you know, sort of combat and, and practicing and stuff like that. They, they, they talked very much in a sort of a collaborative sense in terms of their, their scenes together, their action together and stuff like that. So I, I get the feeling that this isn't just a, oh, here's Sabine. She's going to pop in for one episode and no. then go off on her own. It feels like she's going to have a very 
very strong presence in the series, which is really exciting. And of course, I'm always very excited when any of these teased, sort of leaked casting rumors turn out to be true. So we can and get really excited she looks about like it. Such good casting. As with, we talked about her in previous podcasts, she looks the part. She also has a very, very strong martial arts background. So we can expect to see some very exciting action scenes from her. And I think that fits really, really well. On stage as well, they also did have a live-action chopper. Yeah. So, uh, so she is not the only Rebels. And let you in on a little bit of a secret. The footage that was shown that has not been revealed officially, but we don't consider it a spoiler because it has been revealed through official channels, is that Hera Sindula will be making an appearance. We don't know w- which actor will be playing yeah. here at this point in time. Yeah, she was seen from the back walking into a room, but she's so distinctive yep. that uh, you put her in the context of Chopper and Sabine and Ahsoka, so you know it's her. So that did get a very big reaction from the crowd. Unfortunately, the uh, the uh, guests on stage did not elaborate further. They didn't mention, oh, that's the wonderful blah, blah, blah. They didn't really touch on it. It was sort of meant to be, oh, we'll just put this in front of you and you're just going to sort of draw your own conclusions and stuff. They didn't elaborate, but I'm hoping that it won't be too much longer before we get some sort of official confirmation there she might just be a little bit of a sort of a supporting she character might quite a strong uh, um, ongoing role yeah but true. she is a character that i think fans have been waiting to see her fully introduced into the live action ever since there are sort of references to her we see the likes of the ghost in live action we see her name said in rogue one over sort of the the sort of loudspeakers and the rebel base and things like that so there have been references in live action and we're just like waiting for the day where she just like walks past the screen and everyone's like that's Hera so I'm very very excited that we're finally getting her in live action and one thing that I also thought was interesting with the snippet of footage that was officially released Mm -hmm. but not online is it looks like they have slightly adapted the look of Ahsoka for this Mm -hmm. series it does look like whether they are trying to show that there is a slight passage of time or perhaps reacting to fan feedback Ahsoka's Togruta sort of Montreal her head tails look a little longer in these in this footage Uh, Without the best comparison side by side of full sort of screenshots, it's hard to tell exactly what sort of changes, but they do appear to be longer and with slightly different sort of striping, a little bit closer to the version that we see in Rebels, where she has much bigger horns and sort of head tails. So it's be really interesting to see, get some proper sort of promo stills footage Mm. and whatnot and really compare those. I, I do feel for the costumers that have put a lot of work into the costume only to see that it's been tweaked in that because the headpiece is one of the more expensive components components to a costume but i am very excited i dig her new look yeah and one last little bit of information about the ahsoka there was a droid that appeared during the screened footage who pretty much almost certainly is but at least very very much looks like professor hu yang who appeared in the clone wars he is i think the the keeper of the sort of lightsaber archives or lightsaber lore in the clone wars and he was played by or voiced by david tennant it would be extremely cool if david tennant gave his voice to Professor Hu Yang again in a live action series. Yeah, I liked that little story arc with the the young sort of Padawans learning to build their lightsabers and things like that. I think that's interesting, sort of another callback to sort of the old sort of Jedi way, you know. I mean, the the Empire would have just tried to destroy all the Jedi. We don't know to what extent they would have tried to destroy any sort of artifacts, people that knew of Jedi lore, you know, Mm. droids and things like that. You know, they might not have been at the top of the list, but how how thorough was the Empire trying to, were they trying to eradicate anything to do with the Jedi? Was this droid having to go into hiding? Did he manage to basically smuggle some young Padawans out or something like that that happened to be building their lightsabers or something? So I'm really really curious to see what the appearance of that specific character means for the storyline so yeah there's a lot of information actually about ahsoka considering we won't be getting it until 2023 they only, they've only been filming for a for a few weeks rosario actually mentioned that she had been filming the previous day yeah, so yeah. she literally just i mean they are filming in california and obviously um and is in material, california so she just hopped on over that but they sh- that they screen the portrait has been sort of hurried, hurriedly finished hurriedly produced uh for release for that show so it was pretty pretty fresh yeah yeah well i guess that's the that's one of the benefits to the volume is there's not too much cg work they can take footage shot in there and they don't need to sort of add stuff with cg 
energy. They can take a few shots where everything in frame looks finished and done and they can just chuck it in a little sizzle reel. I also thought it was interesting that Rosaria had very short hair when she appeared. I have to wonder whether well, she cut her hair an to make the headpiece fit her better. Well, exactly. There was an interview in the last couple of weeks where she said she would be happy to play Ahsoka for the rest of her life. She seems to love the character, love portraying her. And we know that she's done a great job um, and I, I think I can say that objectively as well as subjectively because she studied Ahsoka's mannerisms and voice and, and voice patterns from the, from the animated series and replicated it fantastically um, so she what she actually said when she said she would be happy to play Ahsoka for the rest of her life that she'd be happy just to shave her head if necessary and it looks like she's at least partially gone to that gone in that direction yeah, when she was on the sort of fan stage um, being interviewed, she referenced going through the animations and mm. taking snippets of fighting and, and showing that to the sort of her stunt trainer, the choreographer, going, I would like to do this. And then sort of going, well, yes, some animation sort of fight things can't be translated into real world physics, but they're sort of trying to reference the, uh, Ahsoka's animated fight style as closely as possible. She's going through and going, I want to do this. I want to be as close to the animation form of Ahsoka as possible and collaboratively with the stunt coordinators finding what she can accomplish in the real world you know obviously but I think I'm just really excited by how much she is diving into this character she always just looks super happy to be around the fans and at Star Wars Celebration and talking about the series and her involvement in Star Wars it's just really exciting. Alrighty season three of Mando this is due out early next year and again, there was footage that was shown during the panel that has not been released officially, but we can talk about, it, talk about a little bit of it because it has come from an official channel. Key things, a lot a lot of Katie Sackhoff, so expect to see Bo-Katan involved in the story a lot. The armorer returns again. And a few interesting bits of trivia. Amando still has his modified N1 Naboo Starfighter. Very, very cool. Happy about that. And unexpectedly, one of the clips showed what appears to be Babu Freak, or at least one of his species, or in fact two of his species, so Babu Freak and, uh, and a friend, working on droids presumably, uh, and I wonder how that'll fit into the story. Yeah, I like the way that Mando season, the writers, the sort of the, the designers on the series really like to pull things. There was an extended period where on one of the panels where Doug Chiang yep. sort of talked about the way that they looked at things from other sort of Star Wars sources and sort of were pulling things in. And you can really see that sort of in a broader sense, not just the vehicles, not just certain designs, but sort of characters and elements and things like that. Like we had the N1 and pit droids on Tatooine. We've got references to the original trilogy. And now they're bringing in a little bit of sequel stuff with Bubba Frick. I think that's really fun. It's sort of like a, a melting pot that really feels like it's tying a lot of threads together. But yeah, there were some fun teasers in this one. Yeah, yeah. A, a little bit of a hint, a little bit of confirmation, I guess, where fans felt like season three would go. Yeah, it's clearly a redemption story arc. Uh, good to see Grief Karga returning. Mm. Carl, Carl Weathers was in attendance and on the panel and excited to continue his character by the sound of things. So that's season three kicking off early next year. Uh, beyond that... John Favreau already confirms that he's currently writing season four of The Mando, so we can expect that to keep ticking over for a little while yet. I don't think Disney wants to see an end to this thing. I think it's making them so much money in terms of Disney Plus subscriptions and merchandise. I don't think they could possibly think of uh, a future where uh, Grogu is not in a Disney Plus show. I think it's just too much of a hook for them. So I, I want to see where they just keep going. I mean, when they brought Pedro Pascal out as a bit of a surprise guest, he wasn't on the announced guest list, but he did show up for one or two panels. Um, he just looks so excited to be there he looks happy you know i mean gotta be headlining like he is the mandalorian and what is one of the biggest shows in the world you know like in terms of you know disney plus being so successful largely off the back of the mandalorian and with the huge amount of merchandise out there it's just i mean you just want to keep riding that train to just as long as you can so i'm very excited to know that they've got season four sort of being worked on in terms of i like the idea of it just a big continuous story sometimes it's fine when the story is like okay we got one more season let's let's do a one season story arc and they're like oh we got renewed okay let's work on another season story arc so sometimes it kind of jumps around because they don't have a long sort of broad uh generalized sort of storyline concept already sort of mapped out i like the fact that this could be quite a sort of a long mm -hmm. really diving into mandalorian lore especially with this teaser it looks like looks like we're diving more into mandalore and other mandalorians right at the end bogatan 
uh, has her helmet on and she says a line to baby Yoda that I think is really interesting and and leads to sort of really interesting questions about what we'll see in this third season and I do hope that they put this full proper teaser online soon so we can see it the clips that out there it's kind of broken into a few sections uh, the the camera is obviously trying to hide and it dips away from the from the screen in part so you don't get a full clear shot of the screen so it, even for us at home we haven't seen the full teaser that they put out there they better give this to us soon or at least a full proper edited trailer containing some of these ones another fun one that i thought in one of the scenes with greek kaga it looks like they have a statue of ig11 sort of commemorating you know his his sort of contribution (laughs) it looks like a bronze statue i just thought that was fun a little reference to sort of the earlier seasons but very exciting stuff for this. Obviously, it's still, cons- I mean, Obi-Wan's kind of taken the spotlight, but we don't know if Obi-Wan's going to continue. It might be a one and done. Mando, I think, is still the Disney Plus Tim yeah, Poles well, <laughs> title. We're going to talk more about Obi-Wan tomorrow night, and we did talk about it uh, last week in relation to the trailer and other developments since then. But there was a funny moment at Celebration that I'll just throw into the mix here when uh, when Ewan was on, the, on the, one of the stages, and he made reference to hoping we all enjoy... You know, the first six episodes, and he said episodes seven, eight, and nine, and ten. He kind yeah. of, I don't know if he was being hopeful or teasing or 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 just just throwing it out there for someone to pick up on. He was kind of implying that there's space in his mind for more seasons and more episodes of Obi Wan Kenobi beyond the first season. Yeah, it might be just sort of like maybe Disney is is unsure to commit to a season two because it's it's very prequel aligned. Obviously, with Ewan and Hayden together, it's very much in the world of episode three. It's they might be not sure whether sp- the fans are ready for prequels. Yeah. And I think, you know, in the fan space, everyone has been, you know, chanting Kenobi, you know, through their monitors, trying to sort of speak to Disney at how much they have wanted this. And I think, I think, I, I mean, personally for myself, I can't imagine anything other than this thing being a smashing success in terms of how much fans have been wanting this, how much fans are already Already enjoying the first two episodes if i mean ewan's already fully on board he wants to do a season two he wants to do more of this obi-wan series yeah, so in the, same I mean, vein as, in the same vein as rosario he has, he has straight up said that he'd be, be happy to do more yeah so i think it's just going to come down to the budget with whether, whether it does enough money um, raking in for disney and whether the, the the writers can come up with a sort of a a, a a story that fits to continue. But I think with any Star Wars story, as we've discovered, there's always more to tell. There's always more that you can write and explore. Oh, so because some of these stories can take place in near real time. They don't need to span years. So you can slot a story arc that takes days to weeks uh, without necessarily disrupting continuity and, and, and just make that work. It doesn't have to be a big story. It doesn't have to involve all the other you know, heroes or characters or villains of, of the galaxy. It can be quite tight and still very, very interesting. Yeah. All right, Star Wars Visions, the animated series that showed up on Disney+, Plus, where each episode was crafted by a different Japanese anime studio, will be returning with Season 2 in 2023. And the conversation that went on during that panel kind of implied that they were quite happy with the way it went down, and there might even be space for other anime-style projects. Yeah, that was interesting. Um, all of the people on stage were all wearing uh, Visions uh, sort of t-shirts with different characters on it, and the audience really responded well to this. I think um, the Visions did better than perhaps people were yeah. sure. It, was, it sort of felt like a gamble. Certainly the lack of merchandise when it came out, they're like, oh, we don't know if Star Wars fans are going to like this, so if we don't make anything, then we can just sweep it under the rug and pretend it didn't really so, do much. Yeah. But I think it did do well, yeah, it did and do well. It, it's really interesting that they hinted at other Star Wars anime, you know, whether yeah, they're like, okay, that might take. Maybe, whether they're... Maybe a feature, feature length or a proper episodic series uh, where they actually continue things, you know, end-to-end episodes, sequential episodes. I think when we are back in our podcast where we 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 sort of talked about the Vision series when it dropped, there were a number of these sort of small stories that we could have easily have seen a whole series just like on, stories, on yeah. this sort of world like intros, building pilots, yeah. that they had created in one and, and several of those episodes I think could have really done well in a longer format. Maybe that's what they're hinting at. Maybe we'll see more of that. Or maybe they're just going to sit down with an anime studio and go, okay, let's create something sort of tied into the Star Wars world. Will it be in-world? 
world, you know, whereas visions were just kind of creative exploration. They might try and create something that fits in world, but told in an anime style. Or will they do just something in that sort of vision style? Will they just sort of let creative freedom yeah. uh, run wild? So not a lot of detail at this point. We don't have any clue about the studios that are going to be involved. I don't think so. Presumably some of the ones that have already participated, but uh, not necessarily, and, and possibly some other new ones as well. This does bring up a little bit of another interesting conversation point, and that's just a little bit of a tangent. It does imply that uh, uh, this has been, that Star Wars content of this type is being well received in Japan as well. I mean, we were just talking about Disneyland Tokyo and the potential for Star Wars Galaxy's Edge type uh, facilities to expand there because they currently don't have a version of Galaxy's Edge. And maybe if this sort of stuff really does start to ramp up, then we could see developments at uh, Disneyland in Tokyo as well. That would be kind of exciting, I think, because Disneyland in Tokyo is a very, very, very good park, isn't it? Yes, yes. It does rank very highly for people that have sort of made the uh, pilgrimage to all of the Disney parks around the world. Tokyo technically is sort of run by a slightly different company than mm-hmm. Disney, not owned by Disney proper. So they, they, they do very well in sort of taking successful components and rides and themes from other Disney parks and introducing them into their parks for the Oriental Land Company. A lot more detail and a lot yes. more grandeur almost. Yes. So I would love it. In some ways, it's a little more reachable for New Zealanders as well than getting to the States. And it definitely is something that I really hope to see. It also makes me wonder, because of that recent announcement of the shop Disney.co.nz shipping from an Asia-Pacific warehouse, it does make me feel like perhaps if they are maybe expanding an Asia-Pacific warehouse, they're like, oh, we'll just you know have a few other countries that we can ship to as well. If they are expanding merchandising and, that, and therefore focus in the Asia-Pacific region, we do get bundled with the Asian countries a little bit because, you know, us here in Australia are just kind of on our own here. That would be kind of fun and I, I hope that this is sort of all gonna bring about good things for New Zealanders <laughs> yeah yeah all right let's talk about the tales of the Jedi animated series that will be coming to Disney plus this was revealed a little while back when the logo of for tales of the Jedi appeared on a crew gift from amongst the Lucasfilm staff members and it was kind of leaked without any other previous information or knowledge but We have pretty solid details about it now. It's going to be a six-episode anthology series coming this year in New Zealand time spring, so later in the year. They're describing it as original animated shorts, each featuring a story about Jedi from the prequel era. And there were a few concept images leaked, some officially locally and some that were just shown at the panel, but they give us information that Count Dooku is going to have a story arc with uh, young Padawan, so young Padawan Qui-Gon Jinn, who is going to be voiced by Liam Neeson. That's really, really exciting. We're going to see more of Ahsoka's story. We're going to see a very young infant Ahsoka and Ahsoka's mother, Pav T, who interestingly is voiced by Janina Gavanka, who plays Aiden Versio in the Battlefront 2 video game. I'm glad we didn't have to wait too much longer to find out what this random logo meant. Yeah. Obviously, there was some speculation because Tales of the Jedi is the name of sort of a comic set in the Old Republic era. So people got sort of really excited about that. I'm I'm not mad that it isn't an Old Republic era thing. This sounds fascinating. I am always a really big fan of the Jedi, particularly in that sort of era, you know, around the prequels where we had, you know, the full sort of Jedi order, the council, the whole sort of structure and all that kind of stuff. We get glimpses into the whole sort of structure and sort of Padawan life and things like that in the prequels, but not a lot. I'm really curious to see where these stories are going to take us. We don't know how long these episodes are. They do sound really quite interesting, diving into characters that we are familiar with, at least for the ones that there they are, have given outlines for. There are for. a couple of other Yaddle amongst them as well, so mm. people might have only seen minimal screen time and minimal backstory. Yeah. Uh, this has all come from the mind of Dave Filoni. Again, he talked about how this came about. He just, on a bit of a whim, was writing these, writing these stories down without necessarily any specific direction or a green light at that point in time. He took them and discussed them with others at Lucasfilm, and they... Uh, they uh, decided to, well, they said, do you, have you got time? He said, no, I don't have time, but I'll, I'll do it because <laughs> uh, he's been working heavily, heavily on the live action material, of course. So, yeah, this is coming from you know Dave Filoni's script book and uh, it, it should have a decent level of quality that we're familiar with on that basis. 
Yeah, I saw some people referencing this looks very close to sort of Clone Wars style animation. It so it's not like a, a new it's unique what we're style. With. Yeah. It seems like they've like, okay, uh, Rebels was good, but not as well received as the Clone Wars animation style. Fans didn't really vibe with the style of Resistance. So it feels like, yep, they know what works. Let's just stick with it. And it gives a bit of cohesiveness to the Star Wars world as well. If fans really like it. It works well for Star Wars. So I don't see too much, you know, we can leave the experimentation to things like visions and stuff like that. So I was very excited uh, to see the animation style as well. The uh, early images that have been out from the panel look really cool. Yeah, Dave Filoni does warn us, though, that not every story is a happy, happy-go-lucky story. He says, are they fun, happy? I don't know. It does get rough. Some of these are dark. So, yeah, some of the stories are just stories that need to be told. But we know that, for instance, Count Dooku's story is a fall from grace. He was a Jedi that becomes a an apprentice to Sidious, of course. So, yeah, not every story has a happy ending. Yeah, he, I mean, it's obviously he has a story that's going to have some uh, not so great parts, like Ahsoka's story. There has, like, he's one of the sort of the fallen 20 that are referenced in sort of the, uh, sort of the novels and things like that, that prior to sort of the, the events in episode two, there were only 20 Jedi that sort of walked away from the Jedi Order and Count Dooku is one of them. So obviously he had to go through some sort of f- turmoil to sort of turn his back on the Jedi, whether he fell to the dark side before that and then kind of be a big story yeah yeah there's there's a complexity there that nobody really knows why and you know the books you know dived into some of the storytelling but they're not necessarily all sort of official canon these days so be really interesting to see what what the sort of storytelling will be about that that sort of untold story and i'm very very excited to see qui-gon being brought more into because he's such a fascinating jedi he you know there was a, a several characters in the phantom menace that i know fans wish that we got more time with more sort of story development more sort of you know maul was one of those oh he was so cool but we only got him in one movie and then we got a ton more of him in the animated series you know with sort of the the spider legs and everything like that and i kind of kind of wished you know can't quite keep doing that sort of resurrection trick with everybody that dies so going back and telling some of the sort of before time story with qui-gon is fascinating to me and i really can't wait to see where they go with it and one more series that's set to come to disney plus that we need to mention entitled young jedi adventures this one is aimed at a younger audience. It's set during the High Republic era. It's an original series that follows younglings, younglings as they study the ways of the Force and become Jedi. It's described as involving concepts such as compassion, self-discipline, teamwork, patience, and friendship. Young Jedi Adventures is coming to Disney Plus and Disney Junior uh, later in 2023, early in 2023. The first full-length animated Star Wars series created for preschoolers, early grade schoolers, and their families, Lucasfilm tells us. These original stories will follow younglings as they are swept off into adventures and start their journeys on the path to becoming Jedi Knights. We don't know anything about the animation style, so the key information there is set in the High Republic era. It is aimed at a young audience, but we'll probably watch it anyway. Yeah, this this sounds like a like a mix between uh, Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, Dora the Explorer. And like the Galactic Pals sort of um, Forces of Destiny shorts that but, you but find on the Star Wars YouTube. A little bit more yeah. substantial, I think, in terms of but story But still sort of arts. teaching teaching kids... Simple concepts. Simple yeah. sort of positive concepts in a sort of a Jedi framework. So I think this is cute. There's a lot of fans, as they've said, you know, people that grew up with Star Wars are now having kids of their own. And I think there's a lot of people that want to introduce their kids to the concepts of Star Wars, but want their kids to be a little bit older to fully grasp the story line of the movie so i think that this is really neat that they're creating these sort of sort of cartoons and content targeted towards little kids so you're not throwing them straight into order 66 and darth vader um you know watching the movie so that they understand what the parents are so uh obsessed about you can't drag kids around celebration if they have no idea what all this stuff is about so i think that this is cute it won't be spoilery but still introducing the concept of star wars with a lot of positive messages so yeah it won't be for you know a lot of us adults but it'll still be entertaining and just to sort of check it out and see see what they're sort of including in their storylines. 
Now we knew the sequel to the video game Jedi Fallen Order was imminent and we knew recently that it was entitled Jedi Survivor. A teaser trailer has been released. This is coming in 2023. You can actually already pre-order it through some retailers even though the firm date has not been fully locked in. The trailer was, you know, very high quality. Cinematic style. Yeah, as, you, as we would expect, but um, it, again, it doesn't give much away. What we do know, or what has been revealed in conjunction with the trailer, is that this is the next chapter of Cal Kestis's journey. Star Wars Jedi Survivor picks up five years after the events of Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. It's a third-person narrative-driven action-adventure game, um, as with the previous one coming from Respawn Entertainment in collaboration with Lucasfilm Games. Yes, this was very much a teaser. I know people that have played the game or maybe not finished the game might be worried about spoilers on this one, you know, jumping to a sequel. Don't worry, it doesn't really give too much away. We do see Cal Kestis as this is continuing his story. We do see BD, his little cute little droid. And we see a sort of a character speaking very ominously that uh, appears to be of the sort of the Utapau race. Pauan, like, yeah. Um, Pauan, yes, um, with the sort of like the Grand Inquisitor with the lines on the face. And we see a mysterious person in a Bacta tank. And there's a little bit of dialogue, but it's just kind of ominous. It's not really too much of the storyline, but it's it's beautifully it's, done. Yeah. Very sort of, it's, it's very high level teaser. It's conveying that time has passed. He's a little bit older. BD1 mm. is still with him and uh, that there is a new, a new foe to face. Yeah, we see a very, very brief moment of a lightsaber fight, but we don't really see who who is wielding a red lightsaber in this one. So I think it's really fun. Doesn't give away too much of the storylines because these ones really do really do rely on having awesome story. You gotta play along to sort of, you know, read the rest of the book as it were. So they're not gonna give too much away. So it's definitely worth checking out and not too long to wait. And the other upcoming Star Wars Disney Plus title that we, I guess we should just throw into the mix is Skeleton Crew, which is going to be led by Jude Law. Now, I think we've talked about this a little bit in the past, and we may have mentioned uh, the announcement related to Skeleton Crew, but I'll throw it in here just for just for completeness, because we did re-mention that the Andor trailer is out. So this is the a series that was previously known by the working title Grandma Rodeo, starring Jude Law as an older mentor-type character and an array of younger uh, young teen children and their adventures in the Star Wars galaxy. And at this point, we don't know exactly where that's going to take us. Yeah, the description sort of references, it's sort of in the same sort of style as the a sort of Amblin sort of children's adventure movies of the 80s, which of course the two that jump to mind is The Goonies and E.T. Yep. That, and, and, and I guess to a certain extent they're sort of referencing that it might be like Stranger Things or something like that, you know, where you've got the sort of that nostalgic group of kids, you know, with maybe like a couple of older ones tagging along, like in Stranger Things, you've got, you know, you've got the, the retired cop and the mom sort of tagging along with kids and stuff like that. And then in The Goonies, we've got sort of like, you know, the older brother and things like that sort of getting drawn along into it be interesting to see what role Jude Law plays in this whether he will sort of be the adult getting dragged along because you know it's hard for them to sort of the concept out has a starship mm -hmm. so it's pretty hard for you know it to be convincing to have a bunch of eight-year-old kids flying starships everywhere you know it's kind of use, yeah. useful if you have a grown-up along to sort of help with some of the logistics of interplanetary travel but it does look really exciting I kind of wish they gave us a little bit more it would have been fun if they got Jude Law out on stage for the announcement but at least they did formally announcement has a title there was a piece of concept art released yeah. it sort of it felt like they gave us a little bit more about it so that was that was exciting so now we have a proper title we can start talking about it a little bit more formally as we move forward and get more information yeah, I think it could be really fun. I feel like they're, t they're sort of harking back to some of that nostalgia, especially with the, the inclusion of both Indiana Jones and Willow in the Celebration panel. The very sort of starting panel of Celebration was actually more about Lucasfilm. They had you know, Harrison Ford out on stage, not for Star Wars, but for Indiana Jones to kind of release a, a poster and sort of talk about Indiana Jones. And then they also played the new trailer for Willow, the series sort of set, you know, some years after the original classic movie uh, starring Warwick Davis, and they showed the trailer for that. So it kind of feels like they're sort of really pulling on some of the nostalgia pieces. So I'm really keen to, I mean, it'll probably take a little while, but I really want to see a trailer for Skeleton Crew. I think it'll be really fun.
All right, going to jump away from Disney Plus titles just for a moment because the Hasbro panel was a big deal and I've got a long list of products here that I just want to have a little bit of a conversation about. Some of them were expected, some of them were almost known or implied, uh, but some of them were quite fun surprises. So the Hasbro panel gave us a lot of a lot of new products, a lot of Black Series, a lot of uh, vintage collection and um, a few other a few other bits and pieces out of the bag. In Black Series, there are a lot of Obi-Wan Kenobi figures imminent. Well, in fact, they're not going to show up until after the last episode screens, unfortunately, but they will be coming our way. And uh, this involves Obi-Wan Kenobi. He comes with a tiny little version of Lola the Droid. He will be coming out not until next year, 2023, I believe. Black Series Inquisitors, the fifth brother, the fourth sister, the Grand Inquisitor, and Reva, the third sister. Reva also comes out in the Vintage Collection and the Retro Collection. They haven't revealed much officially about the Retro Collection versions of Obi-Wan Kenobi figures, but the back of the Reva Vintage Collection figure does imply that uh, we will be getting a full wave of Obi-Wan Kenobi figures in that line. At so Available for pre-order at Celebration was the John Favreau as Paz Vizsla Deluxe Black Series action figure. And through Shop Disney, coming in later in 2022, there is a Macquarie Concept Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader 2-pack. Now, we were very excited about this one. In the pipeline, so not no prototypes available just yet, are a couple of Old Republic figures, Darth Malak and Bastila Shan. Yeah, I thought... We might get something, well, fingers crossed, we might have got something, and lo and behold, we did. Ever since they announced Zalbar as part of the Gaming Greats Black Series line, I thought it was odd that they released him and not his friend Mission Veyer, or starting, like you say, with one of those sort of more higher-up characters. But at least I'm glad to see that these two, I mean... Uh, I really do hope they give us like the full lineup. Kotor is right up there. We're seeing a lot. Oh, also they did reveal, um, just jumping across, just it feels like there's a, just a little bit more emphasis on Kotor, Nazi Old Republic, because they also revealed that KOTOR 2, the sequel, Sith Lords, is coming out on the Nintendo Switch with, as they teased, restored content. Yeah, um, because tell, tell that story just for those that aren't familiar with it. It's one of those sort of really old stories. Like, obviously, KOTOR, the original Knights game, the Republic, came out yeah. in, like, 2004, I think it was, did smashingly well. So they kind of raced to get a sequel out to kind of really cash in on that. But they pushed too much for a deadline, and we know what happens when you try and force video games to be done and published and on the street by a deadline rather than when it is done and finished. You inevitably end up with an unfinished game with bugs and stuff like that. And so there is sort of elements of the game, storylines, cutscenes and stuff like that, that exists in the files of the game that are, are kind of like locked They're away. You can't play basically. them. Yeah. They're truncated so some story arcs and just bypass them. So when you play through it, it sort of felt like suddenly you were off on an adventure over here and you hadn't really finished what you were doing. I just remember it was a little disjointed in parts and you can still play it you still get to the end and it's still fun but it didn't feel nearly as polished or as thorough as the first one and it's one of those ones where I know for years there was a fan effort to try and sort of basically recode those sections so that you could sort of you know do a patch and fix it in order to bypass those story arcs all they did was uh, change a few flags in the actual game the the content was actually still there on the whole they just changed the flags that that meant you moved from one, one place in the story arc to another so it's really interesting to see that they're not only just re-releasing that on on a modern sort of console, but also advertising the fact that they're going to be restoring some of that content, if not all of it. You know, I'm hoping we get more details on that. But it is interesting to see these old classic games getting brought back onto new, and we're seeing that with the original Knights of the Old Republic getting that sort of old, you know, new slick redo. Um, mm-hmm. I'm still crossing my fingers that Disney's like, okay, people love these things, let's just give them something more, you know, maybe a new game in this era you know people have wanted KOTOR 3 for a long time or a movie a sort of a maybe a CG cinematic uh, mini series on Disney Plus there's all sorts of things but at the very very least at the very least we're finally getting more merchandise from the Old Republic oh, Darth, era Darth Malak and Best Lashan those are really really cool characters yeah. that will go quite quite well together especially since Revan has already been done yep. a number of times there is both a dark side and a light side version the 
Darth Revan was, you know, more recently re-released. So if you missed out on the first one, you could grab that one. If you got in quick, I know, I know he tends to sell very well. And I think that should have been an indicator to Hasbro that yes, people do want merchandise from the classic Knights Hill Republic game. And we're finally getting, getting a few more characters. So I hope this means we're going to get, you know, Mission Veo and Karth and Candorus and all the others. Uh, but very excited. Malak and Bastila are some of my favorite characters from the game. Yep, the other Black Series 6-inch figures that were revealed to jump around just a little bit. We get a Darth Maul from Clone Wars Season 7, a Magistrate Grief Karga from The Mandalorian, and Ayla Sakura from Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. In the Vintage Collection, let's see what we've got on our list here. We've got R2 SHW, the astromech that goes in Merrick's X-Wing fighter. That's been a sort of missing element for a while because that X-Wing has been available with the pack-in pilot. A deluxe dark trooper set with the charging chambers, so the sort of <laughs> wardrobe type components that, that the uh, dark troopers step out of, and this is a deluxe set, that, so it's a little bit bigger and a little bit larger priced. They can actually stack together to sort of form the uh, the corridor of the room that the dark troopers are activated in. We've got a Hoth trooper troop builder pack, a retro collection, a target exclusive in the US, a prototype Luke's no speeder pilot figure. Some people refer to it as an X-Wing, but I believe it's actually a snow speeder pilot. A vintage collection Obi-Wan Kenobi, of course, coming out in the spring, New Zealand springtime 2022, so this year, fortunately. Uh, this is really cute. It includes two different versions of Lola, the tiny little droid, so in vintage collection scale, that's very, very small, but two versions of the droid, one with the wings open and one with the wings closed. It's quite fun. Gaming greats line in the vintage collection scale, a Jedi Survivor three pack, a Riot Scout Trooper, Magna Guard, and KX Droid. Quite nice, quite nice variants of some of those characters in the uh, Jedi Survivor style there. And also pipeline reveals in the Vintage Collection, a Paz Vizsla, a Starkiller, and Hunter from the Bad Batch. Just jumping back because it's not technically a figure, but I could have included it when talking about the Black Series. We're also expecting another Stormtrooper helmet variant from the Mandalorian, the Artillery Stormtrooper. So this is the yellow paint deco on a Stormtrooper helmet coming out in the one-to-one -one Black Series helmet line. Other lines from Hasbro includes Mission Fleet. These are the slightly animated style ones for the younger, younger uh, sort of audience, but I think this is an underappreciated line. There's some really cool vehicles and figures in this lineup. There's a whole bunch of Obi-Wan Kenobi uh, releases imminent. Obi-Wan Kenobi himself with the Neopi, a Stormtrooper with an E-Web, the Inquisitor's ship with the Grand Inquisitor and Third Sister. I think a lot of people are going to be very excited that there will be a couple of versions of Lola, L-O-L-A-59, the Princess Leia's little ladybug droid, an interactive animatronic version. There's, there's two versions of this with sort of two different levels of electronic uh, detailing and features. This droid was first sort of revealed in the Obi-Wan Kenobi series trailer. And for those of you that have seen, it's not too much of a spoiler to say that this droid is already super popular. To me, it's sort of like like the cuteness of BB-8 or BD from Jedi Fallen Order. It's one of those ones that sort of the, the design gets you and then sort of seeing it on screen with a sort of cute personality. I can see people already posting online, very excited knowing that there's going to be a licensed sort of little animatronic version that you can have at home, hopefully a little bit cheaper than these uh, sort of Sphero BB-8s that everyone ran out and got. It looks very cute on the legs. They had it on the table during one of the Hasbro panels. Just and, and, just, and, thing, and it was sort it? of yeah. what the sort of tipping around and doing its lights and sort of flicking the wings. It was very, very cute. I do hope we see these available locally at a reasonable cost because I'm sure they're going to be on just about everyone's wish list, especially having seen it in the show. Okay, speaking of Lola, Hasbro is going to continue their bounty collection line of figures. Now, previously, this was all just Grogu and various little poses, a sort of very cute stylized version of, of Grogu standing about well, less than two inches on the whole tall and they did quite a few waves of that. Now we're going to shift into Lola figures in the Bounty Collection and two of these have been revealed in slightly different poses. So those are static, static figures but I think they're fairly priced on the whole and then they look quite cool and quite cute. For another version of Monopoly from Hasbro coming out. This is Star Wars The Dark Side version, so focusing on all the villains of the Star Wars galaxy, or the key villains of the Star Wars galaxy. 
uh, and that'll be coming our way in a few months time at least I would think. Finally from HasLab, now we talked about this being leaked, it has now been confirmed, in fact it is open for pre-order, a HasLab version of Reva, the third sister's lightsaber, double-sided, double-bladed lightsaber, that goes through, that is available for pre-order through to July the 12th, and if it hits the target of 5,000 I think they're aiming for, then that will be put into production. There are no tiers, no Packins associated with this product, just a straight line from zero to five thousand to to get it produced. Five hundred dollars US is quite a heavy price point for a lightsaber. Sure, it is a double bladed lightsaber, but it'll be interesting to see how this one pans out. There's about seven hundred, seven hundred twenty backers out of the five thousand at the time of recording. Yeah, it's interesting that they're diving in and doing something at a high price point for a character we have only just really kind of met. There have been other sort of inquisitors, certainly the circular hilt design is no stranger to fans. We've seen it going all the way back to sort of Rebels, where the inquisitors were sort of more formally introduced. There have been a number of sort of fan-made inquisitor lightsabers Mm -hmm, done mm -hmm. through sort of channels. Different makers have done it with exquisitely engraved metal with all the fine detail. Um, because there's some great sort of reference shots out there and these are obviously at a little bit of a higher price point Uh, most most detail fan lightsabers are this is a double bladed lightsaber and it does have the uniqueness of the circular guards around the hand grip but it's not as you say, actually use the word exquisite, it's not that detailed compared to some sabers out there that are being produced. No, at, at, at first glance, it doesn't look nearly as detailed as the ones. I know my favorite of the ones is the the second sister from Jedi Fallen Order. She has a very intricate lightsaber, and being a video game, you can extract the files and get all the fine detail. And it looks beautiful when done with a fan-made lightsaber, but the fan-made ones Generally, if you're a lightsaber aficionado, you generally appreciate the just the really fine craftsmanship of fan-made ones. Often, depending on who you talk to, beat out the licensed ones that are made in mass quantities with, you know, budgets a little bit more in mind than than pure accuracy. You know, there are some people out there that will spend thousands on getting a hilt just right, you know, with all of the sounds, all of the sort of the 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 RGB colors, so you can just have it whatever blade color you want, all the different effects and things like that. These ones from licensed companies, they tend to be fixed colors. They generally don't change. They have a few sounds and effects and things like that. And the big thing that I noticed, and I think this was a little bit of a misstep, is the one that they had on display at Celebration was obviously a prototype, but the blades sagged. When anyone picked it up, the blades looked droopy. And if you're trying to get people to spend 500 US dollars on something, you've got to make sure that it doesn't do that in public because people don't want to think if they go and spend that much money and go and mount it on their wall that the blades are just going to sag, you know, almost instantly. Yeah, they probably haven't made it like the proper one will be made, but uh, it sort of felt like a misstep to show the Rancor unpainted first, you know? Yeah. It's sort of like, give us a full, proper made one if you want to convince people. Or just don't make a physical one at all. Have a render. You'd probably do less damage just going, we haven't made one yet, but this is what it's going to look like, you know? Let people use their imagination a little bit better. Don't give them a subpar example and then go, no, no, it's going to be better. You know, for people like, well, I'm going to pay you now. I don't know how much better it's going well, to look. Yeah, I know. Especially when you consider that compared to the complexity of a Rancor or a sail barge or a, or a Razor Crest, there's a lot more engineering going into, into those but they'll be ma- everyone's been making lightsabers for quite some time yet the engineering sure it's complex but it is known compared to some of those other products and the other sort of criticism i see online is the fact that you don't need to crowdsource lightsabers lightsabers are always popular they're already making lightsabers the, the concept between Haslab unique. was to make the big, crazy things that they weren't quite sure if people were going to buy them. They're not going to sit on a store shelf. It needs to be sort of custom done. That yeah, sale well, barge was not going to be sitting on a Toys R Us shelf. It needed to go into the hands of collectors. They weren't sure are people are there that many people that want something this big. You know, if we make it fully detailed, are you guys going to pay for it all? It's a lightsaber. It's not that complicated. There's no extra details. It's just sitting in a box. We already see the Black Series FX Sabres sitting in store shelves, including in New Zealand. That's not that common. You know, 
that's not that sort of hard to imagine. And we've even seen the likes of the Darth Mauls. Yes, you've got to go and buy two and connect them together, but that's that's still a common thing that people are aware of, you know, if you're really a fan of the character. And I don't know that these this new character is potentially earned that uh, people want to see it you know most of the saber makers some people will jump in and be the first to make a saber other people will wait and see if this character is going to be that popular i mean some of the video game characters and sort of expanded universe characters are only now kind of really getting their hilts done by the fan-made sort of lightsaber companies out there because they want to know are people going to spend this much money on a hilt if I go and make 200 of them? Yeah, I think I said it in the last podcast that HasLab should be reserved for those considerably more unique products, not just a slight variation, a slight variation on an existing mm. line. Like you say, we have had, even though you go to buy two of them, the uh, double-bladed Darth Maul lightsaber. And, you know, the um, Kylo Ren lightsaber was a slight addition yeah. in terms of complexity over basic lightsaber. And that's and I think everywhere. The, I think the Kylo Ren lightsaber kind of made a point here that's kind of pertinent is that they had a higher price point and they didn't sell. They were having to be slashed to half price. No, I think a um, lot of people in New Zealand grabbed it at $180 from places like the warehouse. It was everywhere. Lightsabers are kind of an easy sell. You know, they're, they're, they're probably not that much cost actually involved in the manufacture of these things. Yes, they're not plastic toys. They do have electronic and lights and things like that the hilts are metal they do feel nice but they can't be that expensive to make not at that price point this one's got a little bit of stuff but there isn't like there's electronics and bells and whistles in those metal rings there can't be that much extra you know material involved in making that ring it doesn't spin as people have pointed out no, you know no, it's no, not I like you can hold the center thing and have the lightsabers spin around it's a solid metal hilt it shouldn't cost twice because now the core engineering is the same as all the other lightsabers. it's just leds in a plastic tube in terms of like the hilt is not that much bigger on the inquisitors the hilt is not that much wider and bigger than a standard hilt yeah you can get two hands in there but it's not like it's not it's not even darth maul length it's not like it's a full double double bladed hilt as it were so most of the electronics is crammed in something slightly longer than a standard lightsaber and two plastic sticks with leds i don't see why the cost is this high all right most of the story items we want to talk about the rest of the podcast jump around a little bit and some of them are from slightly different sources but uh yeah we still got a little bit to work through and still some really exciting and interesting topics Empire Magazine released some information during the runtime of Star Wars Celebration that I think is kind of pertinent since we're discussing upcoming releases. And it relates to Kathleen Kennedy talking about upcoming cinematic releases. Specifically, she says that a lot of some of these will be set in the sequel era. This is a bit of an interesting revelation in some ways. From the Empire Magazine, she says... We're moving forward beyond the existing sequels as we look to our movie space. The sequel era is what we talk a lot about in terms of where we're going with our movies and just how far out we'll go with that. That's very much the space we're concentrating on. The next confirmed Star Wars movie will be Taika Waititi's as yet untitled film. It's going to be co-written by Christy Wilson Cairns. Uh, meanwhile, Patty Jenkins' Rogue Squadron movie is currently undated but still in the ether. So we talked about this previously, Taika Waititi's film will be the next film, and I think this tells us, I think this is telling us that we can expect it to be set in the sequel era. Kennedy also reiterated that Ryan Johnson's trilogy, announced a long time ago, is still on the cards but not on the immediate slate, it won't be happening anytime soon. She says Ryan had ju- had such a gigantic success with Knives Out and he's very committed to trying to get that done, the sequel she's talking about, so it'll be a while. As you know, we have to work three, five years in advance in terms of planning, and that's what we're doing. Take home message from that, I think the most immediate thing is Taika Waititi's film, as we mentioned, is the next one to come out, and this may may fall into the sequel era based on what we've just heard. Yeah, I think Disney and Lucasfilm are very keen to sort of tie Taika Waititi down into their sort of wheelhouse with the sort of internet buzz on Thor Love and Thunder with the trailers coming out and his sort of cinematic style, his sense of humor and writing. I'm very, very excited to hear more about it. No any any kind of information, a title, something, you know, I can't wait till he's, you know, on TV doing interviews, talking about what 
what he's doing. We start getting some glimpses into what it's going to be. I really hope they give him the same sort of creative freedom that that Marvel has done with his sort of directing style, his writing style. You know, you can you can feel his his touch in the movies that he has directed under Marvel, and I hope that we get that kind of fun. And I hope he fills it with a ton of New Zealanders. If not, maybe film some oh, stuff man, in New Zealand. That would be that would be, that would be great. So we know that Disney has filmed some movies and productions in New Zealand, it would be great if Taika kind of goes, hey, let's, you know, shoot some stuff down in Auckland and Wellington, you know, that will be cool. So, yeah, <laughs> really excited to hear more about that. I kind of wish that they had given us something at Celebration, but I do understand, I guess they're being a little careful because Rogue Squadron's been a bit delayed and they don't want to jump the gun and then have to no, backpedal but this, again. this whole conversation we're just having now does call back to what we talked about in the last podcast that came particularly through the Vanity Fair coverage that... Uh, that the story that the story plans are crystallizing mm. and uh, solidifying, and I think that's that's great. This is, we're going to start to get a lot more of a picture about what's coming out, when, and how long we need to be waiting for theatrical releases and in what order they'll be coming out. I think that information is really starting to bed down um, in contrast to the sort of flurry of concepts and ideas and titles uh, that were happening very early on without necessarily a solid strategy for scheduling. And I know a lot of that's been disrupted by by um, lockdowns around the planet, uh, of course, and as well as um, sort of reactions and receptions to, to material that has been released. But yeah, I think we're at a point in time where it needs to be locked in place. Yeah, I think we're really seeing that in the streaming era that uh, companies like Lucasfilm and Disney can be very much more they can pivot a lot faster to react to markets to see what trends well on when they release it, you know, in terms of fan reactions and merchandising and stuff like that. We have seen just in the past two years or since the release of Disney Plus, how fast they're like, oh, we renounced this one. Oh, we're going to go over here. And you know, they can sort of, they're, they're very tapped into the market and to the audience. And I think that that bodes well that they're listening, um, and sort of giving us more of what does well. Um, and I did, one little thing that I noted, they did ask at Celebration, they got, when they were talking to Ron Howard, they were getting the sort of the fans chanting about, you know, wanting a sequel to Solo. And he was just kind of, he was very coy about it. I don't, he certainly didn't seem to know anything about it. He was like, never say never, but he said he hadn't heard anything about it. And I'm like, I kind of, it would have been fun if he just sort of like winked or something like that. But I do hope that some of the Star Wars titles that didn't get sort of quite the same initial reaction but have got like there's such a huge momentum of fans online that really did love solo and i think that that was one of the ones that possibly suffered from a theatrical release i think if they had maybe put it on streaming i think that that would have done a really good job like in the new modern era where disney is making some titles for theaters and some titles released straight on disney plus i think solo would have been would have done really well if it had been like a straight to Disney Plus streaming movie. I think that that would have done really well rather than it being judged solely on how much did it make in its first three days at the box office or something like that. Because I think it took a while for people to warm to it and it definitely got sort of a better reception. And so it was great to see Ron Howard getting a, a really great reaction, obviously being the director for that film, um, you know, at Celebration. So yeah, just lots of interesting things and very very exciting time to be a star wars fan yeah okay here's a thing you know here's a title that's going to be coming up on disney plus actually in the very near future another star wars lego special will be coming out on august the 5th this one is entitled summer vacation there is actually a trailer out for this showing characters from through the entire star wars franchise um, arriving uh, f for their summer vacation we saw a focus on omega and the bad batch in particular but pretty much someone from every era is represented yeah the trailer sort of shows like a red carpet with fans sort of watching all their favorites arrive we see the mandalorian and grogu we see sort of characters from all different franchises you know r2 and 3po and things like that this is obviously a bit of a tie-on with the halcyon the galactic star cruiser hotel at walt disney world you see um i think it was r2 and 3po wearing like hotel robes bearing the the halcyon sort of symbol on it obviously it's a bit of a tie-in but it does look fun uh, lego is one of those ones where there's like no rules here they can mash up people from any timeline and so you get these sort of really quirky fun stories and i think on the whole people have enjoyed the lego specials that have shown up on disney plus in the, in the last year or two uh, the holiday special and the terrifying tales i think it was 
they're, they're quite fun. Yeah. Jumping to a different format, Galaxy's Edge Batu at Disneyland. Uh, of course, we know there are live action characters that roam around that uh, to give atmosphere and to sort of integrate the role playing aspect. To date, they have all been associated with the sequel era, but that is going to change. Boba Fett and Fennec Shand are coming. They're imminent. In fact, Fennec Shand has been already seen uh, walking around the galaxy's edge at Disneyland in Los Angeles. And we can also expect to see the Mandalorian and Grogu down the line. Yeah, this is really quite fun. Obviously, when they first announced that Galaxy's Edge was going to be set in the sequel era, uh, some people thought that that maybe tied them down to a particular time point a little too firmly. And so you far know? it has. Yeah. yeah, because they haven't really sort of, it was like, well, with the Mandalorian and Boba Fett, we're in the Remnant Empire period, not First Order. So how do you sort of have those? And I guess it's gotten to the point where Disney's like, okay, okay, well, we give up. We're just going to put these characters in there yeah, and guess we'll that. just kind of understand that, yeah, they don't so really far, cross over. It's limited but- them to some First Order Stormtroopers, Kylo Ren from a distance generally, Chewbacca and V. Marathi. And Ray. And Ray, of course. Yeah. Um, but not These characters that, are so popular and... Disney Plus series are such a huge moneymaker for Disney. They want to tie that in. You know, they want to, they want people at the Disney parks to sort of meet Boba Fett and Fennec Shand and then like go home and then go, yeah, let's go watch the series again. Cause that was really oh, fun meeting and them and stuff. And costumes, the merchandise. The, the photos and, and the video detail. that's been released so far looks superb. I don't know how they'll have Grogu as wandering around. No, I think probably in a Mando's corner. Arms. Well, no, no, just or, Mando yeah, carrying. That would be so cute though. Like if you've got like the really clever puppet Puppeteering. Yep. So the the whoever is portraying the Mandalorian's got the sort of the puppeteering yeah, in his or arms. A, or a third party remote control. Yeah, there. yeah. I I think the the, the sure fire head out of the park. People are going to lose their minds if they can go and meet Grogu. There is some video offline of some fairly well done animatronic Grogu's at celebration, and you can see all these people all kind of standing around watching this little puppet on the ground, sort of tipping its head and looking around, and in the Mandalorian sort of props and costumes exhibit. They had a full size N1 from the show and it had an animatronic Grogu in his little his bubble. bubble. And he, waved um, and he waves at people while you're looking at it. And I just, uh, I, I know a lot of us have Grogu merchandise, including sort of the one to one sort of full life scale, but there's something about seeing him move. It's going to be really quite eerie um, and quite magical at the same time seeing him move in person like that you see the people on set they know it's being puppeted before their eyes but they interact with it like it like it's real and i did see just one random tangent there is a shot of pedro pascal giving like a little grogu model a kiss on the head the it's, panel, it's celebration panel, yeah. it's just like really cute seeing people interact with yeah, with the models and the puppets and give the audience what they want <laughs> yeah but Grogu is just way too much of a popular character and too much of a moneymaker for Disney to just keep dancing around the fact that he's not in the First Order time period at the age he is. Whether or not he's actually yeah. alive in the First Order period, we don't know that yet. But yes, in terms of Din Djarin and Grogu, I, I think it was inevitable. They're just going to kind of just ignore the fact that they don't fit with First Order Stormtroopers. But so this might just be the tip of the iceberg in terms of the loosening of continuity within that, that space. And I think that's great. I mm. uh, the forcing the story just into a corner like that was perhaps a limitation that they're yeah they clearly decided they need to move away from and I think this direction that these armored characters these costume characters they're adding and they're really really good choices. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that the Phoenix Shand is not got her helmet on she appeared to be walking around because she's got a very detailed hairstyle yeah. and i remember seeing in the video that they had done all the intricate braiding and sort of weaving in her, her helmet, hair so she's carrying it or something yeah. like that but yeah i mean i guess walking around in the californian sun you don't really want to be wearing a helmet if you don't have to well, sometimes um, she might be and sometimes she might not that and might sometimes i know for little kids it's easier oh, for them yeah, to deal yeah. with a face character Absolutely. than a helmeted character. No. Especially, I know Boba Fett and Fennec Shand aren't exactly good guys. They are still sort of crime lords and bounty hunters. But it's easier for little kids to deal with yeah, face yeah, characters. Stormtroopers are scary, but they're supposed to be scary because they're bad guys and they're wearing helmets, so you don't see their face. So I think that that's fun. it would be really interesting to see the first glimpses of Boba Fett, whether he will have his iconic helmet on or whether he will sort of be like the show where he's walking around carrying a helmet. And it'll be really interesting to see. Obviously, Mandalorian, they're probably going to keep with lore and have Mandalorian walking around with his helmet on because that's a whole part of the show. But yeah, really keen to see these 
four characters coming to Disneyland for if and when New Zealanders can go visit the parks. So that information was, well, at least the Phoenix Shan and Boba Fett component, that information was revealed at the Galaxy's Edge panel at Star Wars Celebration, and they expanded on that on StarWars.com. We'll put a link to that down below. That's where we learned more about the imminent or the down-the-line um, inclusion of Mandalorian and Grogu as well. There was a Star Wars Lego panel also at Celebration with a couple of new reveals, a one-to-one scale set of BD-1 and official images of this are now out. It looks fantastic. It's a character that is very easily and very well represented in Lego form. Uh, and I, th- I think the price on that was fairly modest, something in the order of $160 from memory, New, Z- New Zealand dollars. Ever since I saw this design from the video game, I wanted like a, a well, life size or near enough to life size model, either in Lego or three D printed or something like that, because it's quite an angular droid, but still sort of small and cute. And I thought it would actually render quite well in Lego. So um, no surprising they've gone and done it. Obviously, this ties in really well with the sequel game being announced as well. We see BD One in the trailer, so this is a good sort of continuation yeah, honest, of the character. I can't actually remember, and this is a bit of failing on my part. I should have checked. I can't actually remember if it's got Jedi Survivor or Jedi Fallen Order logo on the box, where hmm. it may well be Jedi. I survivor given what we've just been seen yeah shown. yeah tying in um very cute and i'm sure this one's going to be popular he feels somewhat i don't know like a bit more personality than dio is very cute but i didn't feel like we needed a big lego set of that character he's he's a little less important to the storyline they never really fully developed that character so. bd really feels like a companion like r2d2 sort well, of component to they, to they the storytelling doubled down and included a mm. bd droid in the mandalorian that was really yes cool. yes i loved that inclusion it really felt you know because sort of pulling in from all different sort of time periods and that it was really quite fun seeing the the crossing over of different droids in the mandalorian so this one is definitely on my shopping list and i found the other lego set that was revealed or the other main lego set that was revealed very very interesting it's the first andor themed lego set and it's based on the sort of drop ships that we see in the trailer it's called Ambush on Ferex. That tells us that the planet involved in Andor is called Ferex. Set inspired by the upcoming Disney Plus series that includes many figures of Cassian Andor, his companion Luthan Rail, and Inspector Cyril Khan, as well as Khan's mobile, mobile tech pod and a speeder bike. So Khan's vessel has a rotating double stud shooter, movable wings and doors, and this is coming out on August the 1st, so not too far down the line coming out in advance of the uh, series hitting Disney+. Plus. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, it, I'm hoping to see... Oh, well, I guess I was expecting to perhaps see a bit more from Hasbro for Antor. Mm. Um, but yeah, Lego often tends to be one of the ones that first gets out there, so it's exciting. be fun to see if we're going to see this vehicle in any other form. I didn't see sort of any other sort of vehicle toys from well, Andor from scaling, other makers. If it's in scale, if it's in true minifigure scale, then these uh, these huge. vehicles are not gigantic. Mm. They're not um, Imperial Shuttle. <laughs> they kind of almost remind me of the um, mini rigs from uh, yeah. the old vintage era, mm. that sort of bulky body type style. But I'm looking forward to it. I quite like the design. I quite like that that very brief scene in the in the trailer. Yeah, I was almost expecting to get a Black Series Cassian. You know, like we've we we got the trailer, so we know what his his outfit looks like. We know what the actor looks like. Hopefully, we're not too far away from that. The next bit of news we've got on the list to mention, I don't think it came strictly from Celebration, but as I said, we are talking about things that came out during the time frame of Celebration as well, because it was just a, a bit of an info dump from a number of different sources. Uh, I think that people were just leveraging the hype of Celebration. And this is official news coming from Marvel's comic is a 10 issue mini series just entitled Yoda set in the moments. It says it's described as being set in the moments before Luke Skywalker's arrival on Dagobah and Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back as the Jedi Master Yoda reflects on his life and his regrets. It's told in three arcs by three different writers, so ten issues split into three separate arcs. Kevin Scott, Jody Hauser, and Mark Guggenheim. The series will hurtle back in time to take readers to key moments in Yoda's life during the prequel era, and with the first story set in the High Republic as he ruminates on the past. Interesting that they're, once again, in the way, similar way that they have been doing with Obi-Wan Kenobi, they're reflecting on a, a escaped Jedi Master sort of 
reminiscing on the the failings of the Jedi at, at the, in the conclusion of the prequel era. It's kind of an interesting sort of pitch. It kind of sounds rather depressing. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there's some moments in there, but it's basically just Yoda being sad um, in his little mud hut, <laughs> thinking about how life used to be good. Um, but I'm sure there's some interesting things to, to, to well, tell. But it just from from the uh, outset, you're just like, oh, him in his little pot of idea. soup and snakes, <laughs> and just I used to live on Coruscant. <laughs> Well, okay. well, joking aside, because it is a little bit funny in that regard. Joking aside, I hope I hope the reflections and the and the ruminations do give some because you can kind of see a, a semi straight line between Obi Wan dropping the twins off on on Tatooine and and all around to becoming a hermit, becoming a nomad. But Yoda, his behaviour, there's quite a bit of a variation in his sort of mm. his, his headspace, um, perhaps even more so than Obi Wan and, and Luke Skywalker arguably, because the story wasn't developed when the character was portrayed in The Empire Strikes Back initially, so we've kind of got to redact that story and have it make sense in a slightly, slightly different way. So hopefully hopefully this uh, this comic series speaks to that mm, and uh, gives yeah. us information about whether or not he knew Luke was going to turn up, whether or not he's sort of preparing for that, and, and his act was a, a test in the truest sense, and it, but known in advance by Yoda. That was kind of interesting. Yeah, because obviously before Luke turns up, he would. We know that Yoda is like the one that like senses when Jedi are getting killed during Order sixty six. He like drops his his walking stick and sort of you know reacts. So he would have felt when like when Obi Wan was killed in A New Hope. We don't see that, so we feel like he would have known. Is he still just like having chats with Qui Gon and the Force all this whole time? Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, yeah, it's just sort of be. interesting because, you know, he was the one that kind of figured it out and was like, hey, Obi-Wan, I'll teach you something. So it'll be interesting to see whether he's like, is he communing with others? Has he figured out how to talk to other Jedi in the Force at this point? That would be really cool, come to think of it. Yeah, it, it, the, there's a lot that, that they could be explore because they've got a fair amount of leeway here to kind of pull some things in. It's not a time period that is really sort of bedded down from Yoda's point of view, you know. You know, by the time we get to him, he's spent more than 20 years, as we assume. Uh, you know, he might have done other things before going straight to Dagobah. Um, but yeah, he's obviously been there for a while. He's not got too much to do. So I guess this is a really interesting uh, sort of creative challenge for these writers to sort of tackle and give us a story that might not be enough or they might not want to lock down so much story to fill a novel. So I think a comic is an interesting way and also a very visual way if there are any Jedi spirits mm-hmm. um, to sort of add those in. So yeah, it's kind of an interesting quirky one, but one that I, I am keen to read. Oh yeah, I think I think there's some really good ideas makes the comic story arcs to really fill in gaps and yeah, we do want to get a hold of most of them along the way. And one of the last panels that we'll talk about is the Hunters panel that took place at Star Wars Celebration Hunters, the mobile app game. Uh, we talked about last week that it has been recently opened up to Australia and New Zealand as part of its soft launch. It's not available globally yet, but if you search for it on both Android and iOS, you can actually download, install and play that game right now if you're listening from within New Zealand. The panel at Celebration didn't give a lot of information because there's not a whole lot more to give just at this point. It reminded us that Hunters takes place after the Battle of Jakku during a time of turmoil and opportunity across the galaxy. There's a follow-up article on StarWars.com. It shows the vast array of costumes, 63 costumes in total, that are currently available within the game to um, collect and to use for your for your chosen character. Yeah, I'm really keen to jump in and start playing this. I have downloaded it, but I haven't sort of jumped in because I know this one is one of those ones that's going to grab me. And I wanted to just sort of like really enjoy all the celebration live streams and stuff like that. So I'm... You got some homework to do. Yeah. <laughs> we'll we'll talk about jump, that in an upcoming podcast. Going to jump in and play it. But if you've already started playing it, let us know what you think of it. I get... Since it's been available in the New Zealand market, if everywhere i get sponsored ads mm. for this i get pop-up ads i i even had banner ads on trade me for star wars hunters and i get video ads and like other apps and everywhere so they they seem to be really going hard with the advertising for this i think they really want a lot of people jumping in at launch so yeah. they're really gunning for it to be a very popular game especially that they're doing something like a tie-in novel yeah well that's what i was just about to mention the other thing that's a little bit out of the blue is that there is a tie-in novel it's available for pre-order already through my but it's entitled Star Wars Hunters Battle for the Arena. 
like I say, there's this is set at a specific point in the continuity, but the way the game is set up, it doesn't feel like it is strictly canon. The characters kind of do fit into the continuity, but of course, the the way they interact, it it, it, it can't be fully robust canon. So I'm not quite sure how they're going to make a novel out of that, but that'll be interesting. We may well check that out down the line. So there was a ton of news coming out of Star Wars Celebration and sort of Lucasfilm and Disney at the same time. Lots of series, comics, toys, all sorts of goodies to look forward to. Some very soon on the horizon, some a little further off. Let us know what you were the most excited about. I really did enjoy watching the live stream. I kind of wish they put more of the major panels on the live stream. We got a lot of the sort of the fan stage, some of the smaller panels. I know that they are going through and putting more more of the segments, panels the breaking segments yes, out of the live stream, yeah. on the YouTube channel. So for those of us at home, we can at least follow on. I know if you go searching around on the internet and YouTube, you can find other people that, you know, filmed on their phones and things like that, you know, whether it was sneaky or just out in the open, you know, they didn't lock down sort of filming at all of the panels. So there are lots of bits and pieces out there, you know, from a lot of the sort of content creators on YouTube that posted some of the panels. There were some really neat sort of behind the scenes panels. They had people there like Phil Tippett and uh, you know some of these people that have been with Lucasfilm you know the real makers behind the scenes it was really neat to see some of them on stage of course you know the likes of John Williams turning up to conduct some of the music um, and you know in person there Mm -hmm. on his 90th birthday that was pretty that was pretty cool I wished I could have been in the room to see that in person but I was excited that they changed the release date for Obi-Wan so we got to watch at the same time as the guys at Celebration you know it it, it was a little bit out of the blue it ended up being very early for us here in New Zealand I think we were sitting down a bit before four in the afternoon I I I do feel sorry for everyone that was at work when that dropped it was a bit of a shock (laughs) you know stuck in traffic trying to get home going Obi-Wan is on the TV I need to get home but yeah a very very exciting weekend I hope you've had the time to sort of go through we'll have all sorts of links below and there's lots of discussion in the SWNZ Facebook group posting all sorts of pictures and links and articles and videos to check out there's just a lot to go through and I know we've been talking about it at length at some of our favorite moments um but yeah just a lot of things to be excited and happy about indeed it's a great time to be a Star Wars fan on that note though that's about it for this installment I guess we are done doing talking if you got any thoughts on topics we discussed today we're definitely keen to hear them leave a comment on the YouTube page or our website page for this podcast Thank you for tuning in. We do appreciate you taking your time to listen to us share our passion for Star Wars. In fact, we've really noticed a significant uptick during this sort of period of hype for Star Wars in our in our listener base. And uh, yeah, that's great. We appreciate it. That gives us motivation to keep pushing hard to get these tuning out on a regular basis. Stay tuned to our website, swnz.co.nz, for Star Wars news for New Zealanders and another podcast episode very very shortly like i say we will be doing a special obi-wan kenobi episodes one and two roundup within a day or two beyond that we will be doing podcasts every tuesday and we'll be talking about so that way we can talk about subsequent episodes of obi-wan kenobi so everyone's had an opportunity to see them don't forget you can jump on over to either our facebook group or the SMG or the swnz message boards to discuss all the latest star wars news with other kiwi fans Kia ora, kia noho haumaru, thank you for listening and stay safe. Turo Hawaiki, may the force be with you. If you enjoyed today's podcast, go ahead and like the video, check out the SWNZ podcast playlist for our other episodes, and subscribe for alerts about new episodes. See you next time.